begin. Uh, we're in Psalm 39 tonight, so if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles, Psalm 39. Um, this is a very good one. I'm excited to get into this, this lesson. Psalm 39. And we'll start in the um, front matter there. Psalm 39, it says, To the chief musician, to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. I said, I will guard my ways, lest I sin with my tongue, lest I, or excuse me, I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle, while the wicked are before me. I was mute with silence, I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred up. My heart was hot within me, while I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days handbreadths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor. Surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the reproach of the foolish. I was mute. I did not open my mouth because it was you who did it. Remove your plague from me. I am consumed by the blow of your hand. When with rebukes you correct man for iniquity, you make his beauty melt away like a moth. Surely every man is a vapor. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner as all my fathers were. Remove your gates from me that I may regain strength before I go away and am no more. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for this opportunity once again um, to bring the words, the word to these folks. I pray that it would be a blessing to them. I pray that it would be a blessing to me, O Lord. Um, for I need this, this lesson as much as anyone. I pray that you bless all that we do tonight and the, the time of prayer to follow as well. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, in ancient Rome, when a uh, particularly victorious general returned from a successful military campaign, the Senate would sometimes order a triumph to honor the general. This, this triumph would essentially be a a parade celebrating the general's great victory. And this would be a a very great occasion. It's one to which uh, any military general would have aspired to. It's something that that all of them would have coveted because it was such a high honor. It was, uh, a triumph was only granted by the Senate. So it would have been a very rare and a very, very spectacular honor. Um, And during this triumph, the the victorious general would would wear a crown of laurels and he would wear a purple toga, and that these are clothes that, that, if you know anything about ancient Rome, you know that these are important clothes. These are, these are royal garb. Um, so wearing them would, would mark him as, as someone who is near royalty, perhaps even near divinity. Um, and during the parade, the, 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 uh, there would be a possession and the captives, and, and all the loot from the campaign would come first. And after that would come the, the Senate walking on foot. After the Senate would come the, the general, the, the guest of honor, on a four-horse chariot. Um, behind him would come all of his generals on, on horses, and then behind them would come all the, the victorious soldiers. And this, in all likelihood, would, would have been the greatest day of the general's life. If you think about the moment um, an, Olympics, uh, an Olympic athlete comes to their hometown and, and receives a, a victory parade after they won gold at the Olympics, you think about that magnified times uh, 10,000 and the amazing um, experience, the, the feeling of euphoria a general might have. They've, they've demonstrated that they are, they are cunning, they are brave, they are, they are victorious. And all of Rome comes out to honor them. You can imagine the, the amazing feelings, the ecstatic feelings going on within the general's head during such a triumph. But during this, this triumph, during this victory parade, the Romans had an interesting custom, perhaps to curb the general's um, ambitions for power, Behind the general, riding in the chariot would be a common person, perhaps even a slave. And every so often, he would whisper into the general's ears two very small but, this, but massively impactful words. He would whisper, memento mori. 
And those two words, um, that's a Latin phrase that means, remember you will die. And that's something that would have tempered his emotions during the most uh, glorious and most happy day of his life. Remember that you will die. Hearing these words in, in the back of his mind, it whispered into his ear, it would have given him a, a more sober perspective, a more sober view of all, all the events going on. Because no matter how high he, he excelled, no matter uh, what ranks he, he, he climbed to, in the end he would die like, like everyone else. So this would give him a, a more sober, a more grave view of the spectacle before him. This, this phrase become very popular uh, among Stoic philosophers. Because they, they place uh, a great emphasis on virtue, um, which is not a bad thing. And, and they, they argued that when we have our deaths constantly in our mind, it changes the way that we live. Um, Marcus Aurelius, a very famous Stoic philosopher and a Roman emperor in the second century, he said, uh, let each thing you would do, you would do, say, or intend, be like that of a dying person. Because if you think about it, if, if you knew that you were going to die tomorrow, it would change the way that you lived today. I think if you knew for a fact you were going to die tomorrow, you'd probably live today better than you have ever lived in your life. You'd be more kind to your family and your friends. You, you would certainly allow no room for, for harsh words. You'd be diligent in, in your work as you uh, try to, to uh, shuffle all your, your things around to, to get your estate in order. You would live very, very virtuously, very, very wisely, very, very soberly. It, the, the, the view of death that you have changes the way that you live. And there is wisdom in this, this old saying, first um, used by the Romans and later by the, the Stoic philosophers. There's, there's wisdom in this saying, remember you will die. But long before this became a popular saying in, in the Roman culture, King David wrote his own phrase, his own two words, which in Hebrew read, Hodioni Kitsi. And they literally translate to, teach me my end. And we find this in verse 4. And in our New King James, it says, make me to know my end. So this evening, I want to look at this psalm that so wisely reminds us to remember our deaths. And that may be a dismal thing, but, but the way that we, we, we view our lives and the brevity of our lives and our inevitable death, um, barring the return of Christ, um, it will change the way that we live. And I want to take this psalm a little bit differently. I want to approach it in a little bit of a different way. We're not going to go straight through the verse orders. Um, I want to pursue David, David's journey, David's emotional and, and mental journey. He kind of goes on a little bit of a quest here. And I want to, I want to follow that more, more closely than I do the actual verse uh, distinctions. We see in the very first verses um, that David is upset about something. He says uh, in verse 1, I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. He's trying to, to keep something within. He, he's upset about something. But he wants to keep it inside. He says in verse 2, I was mute with silence. I held my peace even from good, even from saying anything good. And then he says, and my sorrow was stirred up. He's trying to keep something in, but, but this, is, this, this thing he's trying to keep in is causing him to be troubled. He says in verse 3, my heart was hot within me. While I was musing, while I was thinking about this thing that disturbed me, the fire burned. And so he could not keep this, this troubling, these troubling thoughts in. And, but what is bothering King David? What, what exactly is he so upset about? Well, we can find what he's upset about, uh, the clues to what he's upset about in verse 5, at the, uh, starting at the end of verse 5. He says, Certainly every man at his best state is but a vapor. And in verse 6, Surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. And in verse 11, at the very end, surely every man is vapor. And doesn't this, sound, doesn't this language sound kind of familiar? Doesn't it kind of feel like we, we've heard this before? And we have. If you turn to Ecclesiastes quickly, this is the language that King Solomon uses to describe his sort of quest, his emotional and, and mental journey. In Ecclesiastes 2, in verse 17, Solomon says these words. He says, Therefore I hated my life, because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me. For all is vanity and grasping for the wind. 
Then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun, because I must leave it to the man who comes after me. And in verse 22, for what has man for all his labor and for the striving of his heart, which he has toiled under the sun? This sounds exactly like the problem that David is going through. He is frustrated that that life is is so vain, that he works, that, that men may work and try to accomplish things, and yet they leave all their work to someone else. I think if we look at what Solomon was going through, we can kind of have a clue as to what David was going through. What, what, Solomon, what Solomon's problem was, was that he was looking to put all of his happiness and all of his hopes and all of his expectations into the things of this life. If you read the, the book of Ecclesiastes, you'll see he, he tries to seek happiness in, in pleasure, in, in wisdom, and in um, labor. And all those things are good, but they should not be our ultimate ends. This is not what we should put all of our happiness and all of our goals and our hopes. These are the, we should not put all of those things into work, labor, and, and, and uh, wisdom. Um, and so we can kind of imagine that David's probably going through something similar. He has been putting too much stock into the things of this life whether that be the, the work of his hands, what he's trying to build up in Israel, he realizes that's, that's just going to go away eventually, and he's frustrated with that. Or maybe his relationships are, are frustrating, and, and he's having a difficult time dealing with that. Or maybe his health is failing, and he, he feels he reminded that he's not going to live forever. Whatever it is, he's frustrated because he's put too much stock in this life. He has, he has tried to, to, to fill his, his happiness into this box of, of this temporal life. As we see, these things, they do not satisfy, and so he becomes frustrated. And why do they not satisfy? Well, we never have an end of, of pleasure and enjoyment. Um, I, I like to watch uh, TV shows, and, and if you watch TV shows like I do, you never, you realize, especially with Netflix and all these things, you never feel like when you come to the end of an episode, um, especially one to designed to make you want to watch more. You never, you never feel like, ah, oh, I'm satisfied. I've had enough. You want to know what happens next. And that's kind of the way with, with all, all things that, that do with pleasure. We never have an end. We may get satisfied for a while. We may, we may take a rest from, from something, but, but we always want more enjoyment. That's what never satisfies. In regards to our works and our, our labors, we realize that, that no matter how much we do, it's going to crumble with time. No matter how much money we pile up, we don't know who's going to spend it. And when it comes to, to wisdom, sometimes, as Solomon says, the, the fool seems as, as good as the wise person. And so David is he's, he's very, very frustrated with all these things. Um, he, he's, he's putting his, his uh, new wine into old bottles. He's putting all of his hope and his expectation into this life. Um, and, and he sees that everything that happens is, or everything that, that, that happens in this life is, is temporary. In verse 3, um, actually it might be verse 4, um, let me see, verse 5, sorry, at the end of verse 5, David says, certainly every man at his best state is but vapor, and the literal translation of this would be, certainly all men's standing strong is but a vapor. We think that, um, we, we say, you know, sometimes riches are temporary, but glory is eternal, but this, this, this phrase calls to mind the fact that even glory faints with time. Think about, this, this phrase made me think about um, all, all men standing strong is but a vapor. It made me think about the, the, the famous last stands throughout history. Um, all all the, the famous, whether it be um, uh, William Wallace or, or, or whoever it may be, the, the, the famous last stands where, where a small group of, of men try to, try to uh, take on the, the war machine and they, they try to triumph over this, this great thing that is much bigger than them. Um, I, I've been listening to this podcast about the Soviet Union's ravaging Europe after World War II, and I'm thinking about the, the Warsaw Uprising, where the, the Polish Home Army tried to free themselves of Nazi occupancy. And uh, it must have been a, a glorious uprising. It eventually failed, but you think about these, these wonderful uprisings in human history where, where it seems like they will win eternal glory. And yet how often do we think about these glorious men? Certainly what they did was, was brave and, and these sort of things, but but even glory is temporary in itself. And so David comes to the end of his rope here because he's put too much stock in this life. And I think that all of us have been here. I think that all of us have, have come, become frustrated when we put 
too much of our hopes into our, our money or our relationships or our legacy or whatever. Because all of these things, as I already outlined, they all disappoint us. And we all come to this point where David is, where he's just frustrated. He's saying everything is vanity. There's, there's nothing worth doing under the sun. If you think about it, if you, if you come back in 100 years, if you were to come back to Roebuck, you would not even recognize the place, I'm sure. If you walk these streets in 100 years, you'd have no idea where you are because things will be unrecognizable. And no matter how, how well-known you are in the community, in 100 years, nobody will even know your name or remember that you existed. And all these things are frustrating to us. We think about this, and it's frustrating. It seems like nothing is worth doing. And so what is David, what is, what is well, uh, let me ask before I move on. Um, we should ask, is there sin in David's frustration here? Is it sinful for David to be frustrated with the vanity of life? And I ask this question because I found that a lot of commentators thought that there, there was some sin in David's frustration. John Calvin uh, himself writes, It appears from this that David was transported by an improper and sinful excess of passion, seeing he finds fault with God. And that's, that's curious to me because I, I don't see that David is sinning here. In fact, as we will see, David, David's frustration drives him closer to God. David's frustration with the vanity of this life drives, drives him closer to God. And so what is David's immediate reaction to this, this discovery that, that all is vanity, that, that he will not be satisfied in any work under the sun? Well, we already read some of these verses, but in verse 1, David says, I said I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle. Where, while the wicked are before me, I was mute with silence. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred up. My heart was hot within me while I was musing, the fire burned. David, he was trying to keep this in. And I think this is a noble venture because he didn't want his words to become ammunition for the wicked to blaspheme God. And, and you can imagine how easy that would have been done as if, um, as I said, many Christian commentators see David as being sinful here. And so he tried, to, he tried to keep this in. He, he didn't want to vent his frustration with the things of this life. But when David finally caves under the pressure, I think what he does is very noble. In verse 5, or excuse me, verse 4, he says, Lord, make me to know my end. And what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am? David doesn't go and complain to his neighbors or to those who, who hate God. Why is life unfair? Why, why is God doing this to me? Why is everything like a vapor? He doesn't go complain to other people. But he immediately brings his frustration to God. He, he immediately asks God um, for relief from his frustration. And what does pray, David pray for? He, he goes to God, first thing, but what does he pray for? Well, here in verse 4, we find those words that I mentioned earlier. Hodi'ini kitsi, teach me my end. He asks uh, in verse 5 as well, Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my age is as nothing before you. David wants God to show him that his life is brief. Because he's putting too much stock in the things below, and because he's being so frustrated, he wants God to remind him, that his life is not that long, that it's going to be over soon, and that these things that he's trying to trust in are not going to satisfy him for eternity. Certainly, they can't even satisfy us in this life. And so David, David asks God to cause him to realize, to grasp, to understand the reality of his own death. But why does he do that? Well, well during, just like that, that Roman general during his triumph parade, the grasp and the understanding of our, our own deaths, our own in inevitable demise, will temper everything that we do. Because what is a better motivator not to put all of our eggs in the basket of this life? Not to um, anchor ourselves so, so fast to the globe that, that our money or, or our relationships become our, our ultimate hopes and our ultimate dreams and all that we wish for and in, 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 uh, in all that we do. Because when you go outside and, and you look at the church building, and you look at the manse across the parking lot, and you look at the trees, and you look at the grass, and you realize that all of this in 100 years, 200 years is going to be gone, most likely. 
most of the houses that you pass as you go by, the businesses, the restaurants, in 100, 200 years, it'll all be gone. It'll be a totally different landscape. When you look at the graveyard across the way and you realize that before long, both you and I will be there that will both be under the earth, that, that those uh, gravestones will, will wash away our names and that we will barely be remembered by anybody and eventually forgotten by everybody. When you realize all these things, doesn't that make you want to pursue the things that matter? Doesn't that make you realize what things matter and want to pursue those things that matter? Doesn't that make you want to live the best that you can, the, the, the life that is fashioned after God's plan. Seek the things that are above, the things that after a million years will not go away, and not seek the things that are below and after a few years will depart. Doesn't that make you want to, to join closer to God, to strengthen your relationship with Christ, the only thing that you will carry with you to heaven, rather than pouring everything that you have and everything that you are into your earthly relationships? Well, it certainly did for David. Look at verse 7. David says, after this, this whole mental journey, and now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. This is the conclusion that, that David comes to. He has started out frustrated with the things of this life because he has put too much hope in them. He has put too much uh, stock and too much of his, his, his goals below. And he, he, he tries to keep that inside, and finally he pours out to God, and he, he asks God to show him his ways. And at the end of this journey, the conclusion that he comes to is that his only hope is in God. He asks, what do I wait for? And we can ask ourselves the, the same question. What, do we wait to find fulfillment in this life? Do we, do we think, uh, as soon as my, my investments come in and I have more money, then I'll be happy? As soon as I can buy a vacation home here, or as soon as I can retire, or as soon as I can do this or that, then I'll be happy. And, and certainly these are, none of these things that I've, I've mentioned as examples are bad things. It's not bad things to, to buy vacation houses and to retire and to have our investments come in. These are not bad things. But if these are the only things that, that we have our happiness in, if these are the only things that uh, our ultimate expectations are tied to, then we're going to be disappointed. Because our only ultimate and true expectation is wrapped up in Christ. And so we should not wait for the things below to be happy. We should not uh, funnel all that we have and all of our energy into the things of this life. Um, we read as our call to worship this Sunday, um, why do you spend your money on that which is not bread? Why do you pour yourself and your resources and your time into things that cannot satisfy rather than pouring your energy into, into your relationship with God, the only expectation and hope that you truly have. I, I thought of, uh, if you've ever seen a, a child play with um, the, those, those toys with the blocks, and then there's like a board, and then there's little holes in the, block, in, in the board, and the, the, the holes match the, the shapes of the different blocks. You've ever seen a, a child try to put the, the square block into the round hole, and it just won't fit in there. It just, it just doesn't work. That's the same thing, that is, that's the way that we look when we try to put our uh, eternal happiness and the ends of all that we are into the things of this life. It's just not going to fit. It's to use an old, a New Testament expression, it's putting our, our new wine into old bottles. It doesn't match, it doesn't fit, and it's going to disappoint us. Because we, real, we need to realize that our ultimate expectation, that our ultimate hope is in God, is in Christ. But certainly um, what I want to make clear is that this psalm is not a call for negligence. David is not saying through this psalm, um, well, because your marriage is temporary, because your, your wealth is, is going to go away when you die, just, just for, uh, let it all fall to pieces. You know, don't, don't pay attention to your, to your spouse or to your kids or to your, to your, to your money or, or even your health because it's all going to go away anyway. That's not what he's saying. Because we do have to live down here um, for a while, don't we? And this is, psalm is not a call for negligence. But I, I found it very interesting. We find in the last verses of this psalm, after David has gone on this, this, this venture, this, this, emotional, this emotional quest where he, he's frustrated, he, he vents to God, he finds the, the true conclusion that our only hope is in Christ. After that, he prays for certain things. And I think that these prayers from verse 8 onward can help us um, in the ultimate call to action 
when we have come to the same conclusion, that, that our only hope is in God. We see David's call to action afterwards, and it can be ours as well. First of all, we see in verse 8, the, the first part of verse 8, the first thing that David prays for after he concludes that his hope is in God, he prays in verse 8, deliver me from all my transgressions. First, David prays that God would deliver him from his transgression. When we realize that our hope is set on God and on nothing else, that our only expectation is bound up in Christ, the immediate obstacle that comes to mind that we realize is our own sin. Because we are sinners, and that sin does separate us from a holy God. And what David does is when he realizes this, he prays, God, deliver me from all my transgressions. I know that my hope is bound up in you. I know that you are all that I desire. But I know that in my sinful state, I cannot attain to that only desire. I cannot attain to that only expectation because of my sin. And so he prays that God would deliver him from his transgression. Now, I know I'm uh, literally uh, preaching to the choir here, but if there is anyone in here who has not yet come to this place, who has not yet put their trust in Christ, then, then tonight is a, a, a certainly a good time to do so, to, to put our, our hope upon the, the solid rock, the eternal rock that is God. But as Christians who have walked with the Lord for a long time, it means that um, we must work harder on our sanctification. Because we want to walk closer to Christ. Not that our sanctification or, or our good deeds or our abstaining from sin saves us. But if we want to, um, I, I like this analogy, if we want to make our transition to heaven a little bit smoother, if we want it to be a little bit a less of a culture shock, then we should walk down here as if we are citizens of heaven. We should cast off the, the works of the flesh and put on the works of the spirit um, so that our transition to heaven may be a little bit more uh, smooth. Um, this is also kind of the idea of verse 12 uh, on some level. He says, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner as all my fathers were. Um, we can feel separated from, from God because of our sin, and so we should pray that God would deliver us from our transgressions, uh, certainly in justification, um, doing that, uh, uh, taking our sins away and putting upon us the righteousness of Christ but also in our sanctification as we walk closer to God as well. We don't want to be an, an alien or a stranger to God. Second of all, David first prays for God to forgive his transgressions, that he might better, more closely walk with God. But second of all, in verse 9, the second thing David prays for is, uh, he, he says, I was mute. I did not open my mouth because it was you who did it. Next, um, David vows not to complain over the sufferings of this life because it is God who has ordained it. This life can be frustrating, and I think it is a good thing to vent our frustrations to God. But if we come to the point where we're complaining, where we're dissatisfied all the time, where we're not learning the lesson that David did, where we, we are continually frustrated with the things of this life, and yet we continue to put our hope in the things of this life, then, then we are in sin, then we are uh, complaining, then we are, um, in a way, um, sinning against God because we are not satisfied with how he has ordained this life. But David vows that he will not open his, his, his mouth in protest. We realize that God in his ultimate wisdom, he has made us to live here below, uh, where things are transient, where things are frustrating. And he has done so so that we might grow closer to him. And therefore, we should not complain about this life, but we should try to grow closer to God uh, as we live down here below. And third and lastly, and we're going to skip a couple verses here, in verse, uh, the end of verse 8, David says, um, make me not the reproach of the foolish. In verse 10, remove your plague from me. I am consumed by the blow of your hand. With, when with rebukes you correct man for iniquity, you make his beauty melt away like a moth. Surely every man is a vapor. Verse 13 Remove your gaze from me that I may regain strength before I go away and am no more. This is interesting. Uh, David, he just said in, in verse 9 that he's not going to complain because he knows that it is God who has made this life the way that it is. And yet in these verses we've just read, he's kind of asking God to change things. He's asking God, do not make me the reproach of the foolish. Uh, remove your plague from me. Perhaps um, remove a sickness from me. 
or the blow of your hand. He says in verse 13, remove your gaze from me that I may regain strength. He desires that he would not um, suffer in this life. Even though he has said, uh, I will not complain against God because he has made this life the way it is, he says that he, he asks God to change certain things. And that shows the, the consistency, or maybe the, incon uh, not the inconsistency, but, but the dichotomy we have in this Christian life between being satisfied with what we have and yet our call to ask God for the things that we desire and for the things that we need. And we can do... Um, we can profit from the same thing, that even though we are satisfied with, with the way that God has made this life, yet we are still to call upon him to help us, to come to us in time, times of need, to, to keep us from wicked men, to, to keep us from, from iniquity and from um, disease and from poverty and all these different things. We, David can, even, even when he's come to the end of this, this, this mental journey, he can still ask God to make his life here below um, pleasing to him. He can still ask God to remove these, these, these hardships from him. And we can do the same thing. That there's not a sin in, in recognizing that our hope is in Christ and yet desiring that, that our life down here um, would not be difficult and, and for praying for those things. And so we see the, the, this ultimate journey that David goes upon. He, he starts out frustrated because he's, he's put too much stock in the things of this life. Uh, he tries to hold it in. He tries not to, to vent his frustration, but eventually he pours out his heart to God. And based upon uh, him asking God for, to show him his end, he comes to the conclusion that his only hope is in God. And from that we see him pray these certain things. We see him pray that God would take away his, his transgressions because if our hope is in God, we should be concerned about our sin that separates us from God. He asks uh, God to help him not to complain about these things because we know that even though this life is frustrating, this life is the way that God has made it and therefore we are not to complain. And yet he also asks that God would keep him from, from hardship. And all these things are, are things that we can pray for as well. And I hope that tonight you see the vanity of putting too much hope, too much expectation, too much stock in the, in the things of this life and that rather we should put our, set our minds on the things which are above. And when we do that, we can get our priorities right. We can get our prayers right. We can get the things that we desire, the things that we ask for. We can get all of that right. Speaking of, of verse 5, Charles Spurgeon, he says, uh, speaking of the shortness of life, he says, this is sad news for those who tre whose treasures are beneath the moon. Those whose glorifying is in themselves may well hang the flag half-mast. But those whose best estate is settled upon them in Christ Jesus in the land of unfading flowers, may rejoice that it is no vain thing in which they trust. All this life may be vanity and it's fleeting. When we put our expectation upon Christ and we get our priorities right down here below, uh, then, we, then we hang our, our expectations upon not a vain thing, but upon the God of all eternity. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this psalm. I thank you for David asking you to show him his end, to show him the measure of his days so that he might realize that he should not put his hopes ultimately below, but that he should put his hopes above. I pray that you would teach us to do the same thing, not to get so caught up in the things of this life that we forget about eternity, but that we would set our mind upon Christ, the eternal rock, and having done so, we might get our priorities here below right. That we will work on our sins. We will forsake our transgressions. We will not complain about the way that you have made this life because you have made it the way it is. And yet we will ask you, because you have commanded us to ask you the things that we need. And that is what we do now, O oh Lord. We come to ask you for the things that we need. I pray that you bless this time of prayer and that you would hear us and be with us. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Does anybody need a prayer sheet? Anyone need one?